Good morning, Treeline Church, and welcome to Church at Home. We want to welcome you as we're going into service this morning. Again, we're not in person, but that doesn't mean we can't engage and dive into worship and dive into the message and just really let God speak to us this morning. So I encourage you just to open up your heart, open up your mind, uh, and let's get into worship right now. Hey, good morning, Treeline Church family, and welcome to Church at Home. We're so glad that you're here joining with us wherever you're joining, whether that's, um, you know, on your laptop, on your MacBook, uh, on your phone, on your TV, maybe it's, you know, on a podcast later in the week. Whatever way, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, and what we're doing this morning is we're just jumping into worship this morning. So whatever that looks like for you, uh, maybe it's closing your eyes, maybe it's journaling, um, maybe it's just focusing on the words on your screen, uh, maybe it's singing um, as I'm going to be leading us in that this morning. Whatever that is for you, I would just encourage you just to cast all of your anxieties, um, give everything that you have to the Lord this morning, because He's worthy um, of our praise. Um, and uh, yeah, let's worship Him this morning together. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear is my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Hey. The shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies And I'm not, oh, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind And I won't be shaken, no, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't Stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power in His name. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can say There's power in your name There's power in your name There is power There's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out of grave There's resurrection power there's power in your name There's power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear it doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear it doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your
Where the word of the begin One with God the Lord most high Hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus He did it once didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you brought heaven down My sin was great and your love was greater So what? What can separate us now? What a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a wonderful name it is Nothing compares to this What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is The name of He's here with us now. Come on, death cannot hold you. And death cannot hold you. The veil torn before you. You silence a buzz of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life. And you have no rival, and you have no equal, and now and forever, God, you reign, and yours is a kingdom, and yours is a glory, and yours is a name. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. And what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. At this time, we're going to continue our worship through our giving. Just like we sing songs of worship to God, we give out of an act of worship. The Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful giver, and that each one of us should pray and decide on what amount to give. That God doesn't obligate us to give, that it's not something we give out of guilt, but that we give out of a heart full of gratitude to God, saying, Lord, I thank you and I trust you. I'm going to put you first in every area of my life, including with my finances. It's truly an act of trust in Him. There's a few ways that you can give here at Treeline. You can go online at treeline.church, and right on the website, there's a place that you can give. You can also download the Church Center app, and right within the app, there's an easy way that you can give. However you give, whatever you give, thank you. Thank you for continuing to be generous and supporting us as Treeline Church as we continue this mission to reach those who are far from God. We're gonna pause and go over announcements like normal. 
Uh, and as usual, we want to remind you to just stay connected with us online on our website, treeline.church, and on social media for just announcements and things that are coming when we're meeting in person and things that are coming up that we want to make sure you're in the loop about. In a similar vein, if social media isn't your thing, you can sign up for text updates. If you text TREELINE to 97000, we'll send you periodic updates and reminders and just let you know what's going on here at TREELINE. Small groups are going on right now here at TreeLine. If you're interested and want to get connected, make sure you check out our website or the Church Center app for how to get connected with a small group here at TreeLine. It's November, which means Thanksgiving is right around the corner. As a way to celebrate Thanksgiving, we're wanting to hear from you about what you're thankful for this season. So stay tuned on social media and on our website. We're going to be sending out some information about how you can let us know what you're grateful for. There's one big change for today after service, church lobby is back. So if you're not completely tired of Zoom calls and speaking to people over the computer, I encourage you to check the link in the description below for our Zoom call where we're just gonna be hopping on and just taking an opportunity to chat with each other, see what's going on and stay up to date in each other's lives. Now let's dive into the message and I'd encourage you to engage however that works best for you. If that means getting out a journal, great. If that means just turning off any other distractions, making sure this is all you're paying attention to, I encourage you to do that as well. But let's dive into the message right now. Hello, friends, and welcome. So glad to have you here with us. However you're joining us, if you're watching this premiere on Facebook or YouTube, or you're listening sometime during the week, perhaps in your car, maybe at the kitchen, wherever you're listening, however you're engaging with us, we just want to say thank you. We're so excited to have you with us. And just a reminder, if there's anything we can be doing for you, we don't want this to just be one-way engagement. If we can be praying for you, if there's any needs that we can meet, don't hesitate to reach out. Let us know. Send us a text, an email, a message on Facebook, and let us know how we can be there and be supporting you as the body of Christ. Well, you guys probably figured out that this last week has been pretty crazy. And if we can be honest, it's been about par for the course for 2020. 2020 will go down on the record books for very many reasons. There's a lot of reasons why things have been unusual and a little bit hectic and crazy. And We've been waiting, right? We've been waiting for some election results. The most 2020 thing that could have happened in this election happened. We don't have results right away. Normally on Tuesday night, we find out on Wednesday morning who won the elections, and especially this big one of the presidential election being hung up this week and just trying to figure out who is going to be, looking like it's one, looking like it's the other, and just so much uncertainty. And no, and no one likes waiting for anything, whether for its election results or waiting in a line. No one likes it. It's not something that's exciting to do. No one's like, hey, sign me up. I really can't wait to wait. Waiting stinks. It's no fun. Being in a line is terrible. Think about having kids now and going to amusement parks. And I love taking my girls to Kennywood. It's fun. The worst part, though, the lines, right? Waiting in line. Now, I've been in some amusement parks where the lines were so overbearing, where it was like 95% of the time was waiting in the line, and maybe, maybe I'm being a little generous, that 5% of the time was actually being on a ride or doing something that was actually amusing. The rest of the time, you're waiting. Matter of fact, one time I remember when I was a teenager, I had the opportunity to go to Universal Orlando. It was an amazing theme park. I went with some of my family members, my aunt and uncle, my cousins. First day we got there, we waited in line all day long and almost got to ride nothing. My uncle had enough of that. The next day he went out and bought us all those speed pass things where you don't have to wait in line anymore. You go to the exit part of the line, you show them your little fancy pass and you get to cut everyone off who gives you dirty looks and you get on the ride in front of all of them. But hey, no one likes to wait in line. And I don't know about you if it's just me, but I feel like I have a spiritual gift for picking the wrong line at the store. Is it just me? Is, is anyone else feel this way? I think I do my due diligence and I study the line, the cashier, how many people are in the line, how much stuff is in their cart, right? But it never seems to fail. I always pick the line that moves the slowest, that has some form of issue, that something just blows up and it doesn't work and here I am waiting in line while everyone else in the store got to check out and here I am waiting. No one likes to wait. Waiting is terrible. But can we just recognize and realize the genius 
of Chick-fil-A when it comes to waiting. Their food is delicious, but no one's gonna wait that long for their food. But they have somehow figured out with that line wrapped around the building a few times going down the street to get people through that line in about 10 minutes. We could probably all agree that whoever is in charge, whoever designed the Chick-fil-A drive-thru, we should probably put them in charge of everything. Matter of fact, I was kind of tempted to write Chick-fil-A drive-thru engineer on the write-in for the presidential election this year. No joke. Actually, I'm kidding. But see, they, they really figured the thing out because no one likes to wait. No one likes to wait. And we've been waiting. That's been our season. It's been our year. We've been waiting for this pandemic on top of election and everything else. We've been waiting for the pandemic to end. We've been waiting for things to get back to some sense of normalcy. You've been waiting for your kids to go back to school if they've been home and online. You know you've been waiting for that one. Maybe in your job, you've been waiting for things to get back to normal or go back to the office. Maybe you've been waiting for sporting venues and, and concert venues and being able to go do big public events and you've been missing that or even the amusement park and everything else that from our life has changed so much. We've been in a season of waiting. We've even been waiting as a church. Even as a church, the school we were meeting at got closed and it's not been opened up for us to meet there yet. And we've been waiting. We've been waiting to be able to meet on a regular basis like we did with kids ministry and the hospitality and worshiping and coming together and hearing the message. We've been waiting. It's just been a season of that in 2020. Now, if we're honest, you're like, where are we going with this, Brian? We sometimes have to wait, not only in those things in life, there are times when we have to wait on God. And just like in anything else, that not, is not always easy and sometimes can be really frustrating. But if we've said yes to a relationship with Jesus and we understand that God can do anything and he wants to give us a good life and give us a good things and experience this life to the full, sometimes we have to wonder, well, God, why don't you just step in and do it now? Why don't you open the door now? Why don't you make a way? Because see, many times in life, through all the different phases, we are waiting for a breakthrough. And I could probably pretty much guarantee that you right now, no matter what's going on in your life, that you are in need or you are waiting for a breakthrough from God, that you need him to open a door, perhaps in your family or the relationship or maybe with your finances or maybe with your career. You're waiting for that spouse, that right person, Mr. Wonderful or Mrs. Right, whoever it is. You're waiting for them to come along. We're all waiting for something. And sometimes we're like, God, where is it at? Lord, I'm tired of waiting. Could you just open the door? Could you make the way? Could you provide? And it's frustrating to have to wait on God. Now, there's all kinds of stories throughout the Bible for people who've had to wait, that have had to wait on God to show up, wait for God to bring the breakthrough, wait for God to provide. And they were probably frustrated about it too because no one likes to wait. And there's a great example of this all the way back in the Old Testament with God's people, God's chosen people, the people of Israel. And now see, they were living their life, they're going through life, and here's what happened. They started to disobey God. God gave them some very specific commands. Here's the things I want you to do, and they wouldn't do it. And they didn't just not listen once. It was over and over and over and over, generation after generation who just disobeyed God and didn't live the way that he asked them to live. They broke the agreement. They're like, we're going to not live for you, God. And so just like when we don't live for God and we sin, when we break the rules or we don't follow through with what God asks us to do. There's consequences. Now, God will forgive us and there's grace, but there's always consequences for our sins. And the same thing was true for them. And so God decides that, hey, I got to bring down some consequences. Why? Because I love you and I want you to learn and be obedient and to follow because my way is the best way. And so he sends some people to them who are called prophets. Now, in the Old Testament, these prophets were people who would speak on behalf of God. God would give them a message and they would relay that to the people. Sometimes the other way too, that these prophets would speak to God on behalf of the people. A lot of times kings would see the counsel of a prophet to hear what it was that God was speaking, the direction that he was giving them as a people. And there was a prophet in the Old Testament named Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was someone who probably wasn't too popular because he began to tell the people, hey, you know all that disobedience? Remember all that stuff that you didn't do? Remember how God gave you chance after chance after chance and you just didn't listen and you didn't obey? Well, now things aren't going to be so great. And he began to prophesy and tell them how these terrible things were going to happen, how the nation of Babylon was going to come in and, and destroy their nation, that it was going to basically burn it and turn it into rubble, send into exile all the people, that it was going to be a shadow, a shell of itself, that they were going to lose their culture, so many things that were important to them. So you can imagine he wasn't too popular with that. But then something happens in the book of Isaiah as we're reading through all of that. There's a shift in chapter 40. And he begins to tell them how God loves them and how he has a plan for them and how he's a, a strong and loving and caring and merciful God. And he's going to be with them no matter what. Then there's a popular passage that you might have heard or it's a little familiar. But here's what it says in Isaiah 40, starting in verse 29. It says, he gives strength to the weak 
and he gives power to him who has little strength. Even very young men get tired and, fe- and become weak and strong men trip and fall. But and then verse 31, but they who wait upon the Lord, they will get new strength. They will rise up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weak. I love this promise that he gives them. And here's some little context for you in this. See, beforehand, before when he started in the beginning of the book, he was telling them this is what's going to happen. And they're like, well, we're not even sure this is going to be true. And this is how they knew he was a prophet. It happened just like he said it. And now right here in this chapter, they are already in exile. They're living. Babylon came down. It destroyed them all. They're living in pain. They're living in turmoil. They're living in grief and agony. It's a terrible life in existence. And this is where he's speaking to them, not from the other side of they've experienced the freedom, they've experienced the promise of God's restoration. They're in a moment of pain. They're in a moment of waiting on the breakthrough to come. And God gives them this promise. And I love this imagery, the strength that comes from waiting on God. And then just even the beautiful poetry of talking about being like an eagle, that we will mount up with wings like eagles. And thinking about that, that, you know, as a bird, it takes a lot of energy to fly. Flapping those wings takes, especially if you're an eagle, that's a really big bird. It takes a lot of energy to be able to do that. But something that's amazing about eagles is that they have such a wingspan and they're of such a size that they don't have to flap. Yeah, they get started, but then they do something amazing. They begin to soar because of the up currents and the temperature change. They can catch some of that updraft or some of the winds that deflect off of the hills or the terrain. They can catch that and they can soar almost an infinite amount of time. They've even done studies where eagles, they've watched them, observed them that out of an hour of flight, they may have maybe flapped their wings for two minutes of it. And the rest of the time they're up there soaring. It's pretty amazing. I love this analogy. Why? Because God is telling us that when we wait on him, just like they had that wind that helps them to soar and they don't have to exert all the effort, the same is true in our lives. That we don't have to look like some crazy bird flapping over here, trying to get it all done in our own strength, our own might, and saying we're going to get through this and just power through. But if we just wait, if we wait and we trust in the Lord that his spirit, just like the eagle's wings, catches that wind, that God will help us and he'll take the burden. It won't be all in our own effort, but instead it will be in God's strength. See, it's not about trying harder. It's about trusting and waiting in the Lord. And so as we talk about the importance for us to wait on the Lord, waiting on God, Even though that's not fun, there's important things and four quick truths that I want to share with you today on why it's important for us to learn to wait on God. The first one is this, waiting on God requires patient trust. We started off by saying waiting stinks. No one likes to wait. And even waiting on God, it's still challenging and it requires patience and it requires trust. I heard someone joke once that you're never supposed to pray and ask God for patience. That's one thing you're not supposed to pray for. Why? You don't want God to give you a trial to have to be patient through. And if we're honest, no one has to pray for patience. That's just part of life. We're all going to have to have that. But we're going to have to be patient with God too. And we're also going to have to trust. Have you ever done one of those experiment the uh, where you do a trust fall where you get behind somebody and they you know they close their eyes and two people stand back there and they're like hey you're just gonna fall back and we're gonna catch you it's pretty unnerving if you've never done it there's a video that was on the internet and there was a couple of friends trying to convince one of their guy friends to do that to lean back and they're gonna catch him and so they tell him hey we're gonna we're gonna catch you just close your eyes and fall and we'll catch you and he's like oh I'm not sure we would they're like no we're not messing with you we'll really do it so he closes his, his eyes and you know he stands there straight and they get behind him ready to catch him. And then instead of falling backwards, he falls forward right on his face as his friends are like, no, 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 wait. He fell the wrong way. But here's what I know about God. No matter what direction you fall or what direction you fail, back, forward, side to side, God will always be there. And waiting on God requires patience and it also requires us trust in him. It means giving God the benefit of the doubt that he knows what he is doing. And honestly, there are times when waiting on God, it's his way of seeing that we will trust in him before we move forward. Not doing it in our own strength or our own ability, but choosing to trust him. The second one is this, waiting on God reminds us that God is in control. Friends, aren't you thankful that God is in control, that we are in control? But God is in control. Psalm 135 and 6 talks about waiting and it says this, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits and in his word I put my hope. 
I wait for the Lord more than a watchman wait for the morning, more than the watchman wait for the morning. Well, what's that little language there at the end about a watchman waiting? Well, see, in Bible times, in their villages, in their towns, they would have walls that would protect the city from intruders. And there would be a watchman up on that wall whose job all through the night would be to watch and stay up all night long and watch to make sure the enemy wouldn't attack. Now, they couldn't control the circumstances, but all they could do is watch, wait watchfully and alertly that if something would happen, they could spring into action to let people know. And they would have to wait for the sunrise. Now, see, they couldn't control the sunrise. They couldn't make daybreak get there faster. All they could do is wait and watch and be ready to take action. And this is what this psalm is saying, that we will wait like a watchman on the wall, knowing that we've got to watch and be faithful and do our part, but that there's only things that God is going to be able to do because he is in control. Waiting reminds me that I am not in charge and that I am not God. See, I'm a guy and I like to fix things. And I can't speak for women and maybe you, you're a girl and you like to fix things, but I know guys and I know me, I like to fix stuff. Matter of fact, some of you guys like to fix stuff so much, you find stuff that's not broken and figure out a way to fix it. Now, some of the wives just said amen right there because you said, yeah, that's right, you're trying to fix everything. And I experienced a little bit of this. A couple weeks ago, we had a little mishap in the kitchen and um, a plastic cup got a little bit melted in the microwave and it stunk something fierce. I didn't know burnt plastic it could smell so terrible. Smell up the whole house. The microwave I thought was ruined. So immediately, what do I do as the guy? I'm on Google and I'm searching all the things that you do and, you know, put the vinegar and do this thing and wipe this down and put this in there and try to get the smell out. And it wasn't coming out fast enough. So I'm getting back on the phone. I'm researching, okay, I gotta get a new microwave and install it and do all this stuff. And Christy's like, what are you doing? Can, can we give it like five minutes to see if the smell goes away? But I, I'm a guy. I have to try to fix it and just like to report because I'm sure you guys really on the edge of your seats here wanting to know the microwave was fine and eventually the smell went away and it's all good and we changed the filter and here we go we're back to microwaving and nuking everything and having delicious popcorn but we want to fix things but what we got to remember is that waiting on God reminds us that God is in control that we are not in control the third one is this waiting on the Lord allows God to do his work now here's something I'm going to tell you and you might not believe me but this is true God's timing is best Now, that might be one of the most challenging things you hear me say today because it wants to be my timing is best, right? God, forget your timing. I need you to show up now. I need you to fix this now. I need you to open the doors now to make the way. Whatever it is that you need to do, God, do that now. And see, what we got to understand is that God's timing is best and that God is working even when we don't see it. Even if we don't feel it or recognize it, we can trust and know that God is working and waiting on God allows him to do his work. It's like a farmer when they plant a seed. It takes time for that seed to germinate and grow, but they still got to cultivate and water. There's still something happening even if you don't see it. Now, one of the most amazing plants that I was reading about this week is actually Chinese bamboo. When they plant it, they plant the little bulb and there's like a little one inch sprout that comes up out of the ground. Now they have to water that and cultivate it for five years years and all they see is a little one inch sprout sticking out of the ground. But then after five years, something amazing happens. That the bamboo grows 90 feet in 90 days. That's pretty amazing, right? And you have to ask the question, when did the bamboo grow? Did it grow in those 90 days? And what was going on in those five years? What you couldn't see in those first five years was taking place under the ground. That there was a root system, a network of roots growing wide, growing deep to be able to support that growth that was going to happen for that bamboo shoot to shoot up out of the ground 90 feet, almost 100 feet in the air. And the same thing happens in our lives with God. The friends, you might not see it. You might not know it. You might not recognize it. You're like, man, I've been gone. I've been falling after you. I've been praying. I've been seeking. I've been diligent. I've been cultivating this thing. And it just seems like a one inch bamboo sprout sprouts coming out of the ground. God, what is going on? And many times God is doing things that we will never see above the surface. And honestly, friends, we may not even understand on this side of eternity, the way that God is working and moving in our life. And just because we don't see the evidence of it doesn't mean that God isn't working on our behalf. Waiting on God allows him to do his work. The fourth and final one is this, waiting on God increases my strength. 
Waiting on God increases my strength. Well, how does waiting increase my strength? Well, see what you gotta understand. Waiting on God is not a couch potato sport. It's not like you're like, okay, God, I'm gonna wait on you. I'm just gonna go chill over here, watch Netflix for a while and just wait for you to do your thing. No, no, no. That's not what it looks like. That it's actually something active. And here's what you've gotta know about waiting on God. Is that God is more interested in what he's doing in you than what it is that he's doing through you. Now, this took me a while to learn in my life and I'm still learning this lesson. See, even as a pastor, as a church planner, you're like, I want to do these great things for you. I want to do these great exploits. I want to reach people for you so that people can know you and love you and experience the grace that I have come to know. But here's what's true is that God is more interested in what he's doing in me to help me to become more like Christ, to become to live a more godly life than what it is that he could accomplish through me. And the second part of this is also true, that God is more interested in what he's doing in you than what he can do for you. That door that he can open, that healing that he can bring, that restoration that he can make happen, whatever that breakthrough that you're waiting for, God is more interested in what he's doing in you than what he can do for you. That he wants to shape you and mold you to become more like Christ. That he wants to develop godly character and strength and the spirit, the gifts of the spirit inside of you. That God is more interested in that than what it is he can do for you. And that when we wait on God, it builds our faith. It builds our trust. It builds our reliance on God. It helps us recognize that we are not God and we can't do it in our own strength, our own intellect, our own wisdom, our own gifting or ability will all fall flat compared to God's way, compared to his will, compared to his power and might. And when we build that faith, when we flex those muscles, when we have to be patient and wait, it builds strength in us. It helps us to become more like Christ. So what does this look like practically? As we wrap up today, what what does this waiting thing look like? Okay, Brian, I hear you and I hear those four things that God's trying to do in me. And yeah, I'm down with all that, but how can I wait? Lord, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated. I want that breakthrough, but I I need God to open up the door. I need him to make the way and see what does it look like practically? It looks like drawing close to God. Waiting on God looks like drawing close to him. And waiting is something that's active and not inactive. So you remember the psalm where it talks about the watchmen. They were actively waiting. They weren't up there sleeping on a cot. No, they were watching all through the night, ready, waiting, knowing that they pray for the morning, that they long for the morning, what what God can only do to bring the morning, to bring the breakthrough, but that they were actively, they were involved, and it takes some action. So there's a few things that you can do, and these aren't going to be earth shattering, but they are foundational to our faith and central to us understanding waiting on God. Two things. The first one is that you have got to spend some quiet time with God. You've got to spend time in his word. Even if it's just opening that Bible app, opening a devotion, spending a few minutes reading and studying God's word, reflecting on it and talking to God, making your prayers known to him, letting him know where you're at, venting your frustration, sharing your desire, sharing your heart and what you're going through. Maybe getting a book or a notebook and journaling some of the thoughts that you have. Maybe some of your prayers, writing those down or some of the things you feel that God is sharing you or teaching you, but you've got to spend time with God. You've got to draw close to him. That strength that comes from waiting is being connected to him. And the second part is the corporate side of that expression. I know things have looked different this year and it's been really challenging, but to continue to stay engaged, to get connected. We're going to have another date coming up here right before Thanksgiving. We're meeting at the fire hall again. If you're comfortable, come on out and join us. If not, stay engaged online. Get get involved in a small group, either one of the ones in person or meeting online, but stay engaged with that corporate expression. It's so vital to have those two things going on a personal walk in relationship and time with God, and that corporate expression coming alongside of other believers who are going to challenge you, who are going to encourage you in your faith to help you through that season and time on waiting that is not meant to be done alone. See, friends, as we talk about that verse in Isaiah 40 that reminds us when we wait on God that he'll renew our strength, 
And that if we wait on him, that he'll renew us with like wings as eagles and we'll be able to soar. That wind that enabled them to soar will be just like when we wait on God, his strength, his spirit, the Holy Spirit will enable us to do things in his strength and not in our striving. So I don't know what it is, the breakthrough that you're waiting for. If you're like, God, if you could, if you could just make the relationship happen, if you just bring the right person along and God's saying, just simply wait on me, be there with me. If you will just simply lean in or whatever it is, if it's the financial breakthrough or if it's the job or the career opportunity, if it's a healing of a relationship or a family member, I don't know what it is that you're waiting for. I don't know what the breakthrough that it is, but simply choose to trust and wait on God and lean in, lean into him. I know this has been such a challenging year for us in waiting in so many areas, but I think it's a beautiful reminder for us that those who have said yes to following after Jesus, that we need to surrender, that we need to follow, we need to wait and trust in him and he will enable us by his spirit to overcome if we'll just wait. Even if you don't see it, even if you don't feel it, know that he's building that character in you. Know that he is teaching us that he is God and we are not and that it's gonna require patience and trust that he has our best interest at heart. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that we can trust you and know that you have our best interest at heart. God, I know how frustrating it can be to wait in the natural and also just waiting on you, Lord. Sometimes it feels like we could just cry out and say, God, could you just move the timetable up just a little bit? I don't know how much longer I can hold on. I just pray today for those, God, who just don't feel that they can hold on or wait any longer. God, I pray that you would meet them right where they were at. God, I pray that they would feel your grace and your love surrounding them even right now. And God, we can be reminded that you are in the waiting. God, that in the midst of that waiting. It's not an idol sitting by, standing by waiting, but God, it's an active faith thing, doing our part, drawing close to you and trusting and surrendering and submitting our life, God, to you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that you are in the waiting and that there's no situation too big or too small for you. God, I thank you for breakthroughs in people's lives. And God, I thank you for whatever it is, whatever the need that they have currently, God, that they'd be able to bring it to you and believe and trust that you are working on their behalf. Lord, I thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Friends, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so thankful to have you with us and we look forward to connecting with you again real soon. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name. Thanks so much for joining us for Treeline Church at Home this morning. We can't meet together in person, but we're still grateful for all the different ways and opportunities we have to engage during this season. I'd encourage you to continue to do that throughout the week. Just find ways to find, reach out to other people and stay connected and be the church this week.